Hello, my name is Dr. Kenyon Williams. I'm professor of percussion here at Minnesota State University Moorhead. I'm speaking to you from inside the Minnesota State University Moorhead Percussion Studio, home of the Dragon Drumline and Fuego Tropical World Music and Percussion Ensemble. Today I'd like to talk with you about the 2022 North Dakota All-State Snare Drum Etudes, beginning with the first etude. Now, rather than simply play these pieces for you, I want to kind of walk you through a little bit of a mini lesson so you can attack the piece in a better manner, learn it in your own way, but also learn it in a manner that's going to make you able to play it at your absolute peak. So, for starters, let's start with the top etude, which is what we call the orchestral, or in this instance, the classical snare drum etude. Now, a major mistake a lot of beginners make is they assume that all snare drum rolls are the same. In the classical etude, we should be using what are called buzz, or orchestral rolls. <laughs> these type of sounds. For the rudimental snare drum roll on piece on the bottom, we would use our double stroke <laughs> rolls. So, let's start with the classical. We're going to focus on those snare rolls. Now, the very first thing you want to remember is always start slow. Don't begin practicing this piece at a pell-mell 120. <laughs> You're not going to be ready for that. You're not going to play it well. Always start with your best friend and my best friend, an old school metronome, or of course your phone app as well. I'm using this because my phone app's not quite loud enough for the video. But I would start practicing right off the bat. It probably is, as a high school student, probably around about 70 clicks per minute. That's gonna allow me to really sit back and focus on getting good technique, good dynamics, and good sound. Now, just looking at that very first few measures, I wanna make sure I can absolutely count and play the etude. If I cannot count it, one of my mantras is if I can't count it, I can't actually play it, I'm guessing. So I have to be able to count it or I'm not actually playing it. So just those first few bars, if I got my metronome and I'm thinking like this, okay, one E, a two, and a one E, and two, and a one E, a two, and a one E, and two. Notice the first two bars are similarly, are exact same sticking, exact same feel, only I add buzzes to my um, second half. So my beginning, then I add the buzz to that same skeleton. Now, some of you may be wondering, what do I mean by skeleton? Skeleton is the hand motions I would use when I'm doing my buzz rolls. For example, that buzz roll at the end of the second measure, one E and two and a. I'm not gonna go one E and two and try to squeeze in as many as I can. That's just gonna give me sloppy rhythms and sloppy sounds. I'm gonna use a very specific skeleton, in this case, a 16th note bass. So that measure is the second bar of the piece, one E, a two, and a. Now add the buzz, and of course add the downbeat. All right, so always be thinking of the skeleton. That means when I go down to the second line, the very last measure of the second line, my skeleton there is one E and a two E and a. I'm keeping that 16th note skeleton. Now add the buzz, and on the downbeat of the next bar. Again. Okay, so keep those skeletons in mind. Now, sticking choices. One uh, aspect I like to keep both in the drag and drum line and in my classical playing is basically a right-left, right-left dominant hand sticking. Now, if you're left-handed, that would mean that your left hand is on the downbeats and the ands. But for most of us that are right-handed, that means our right hand's on the downbeats and the ands, and our left hand only plays the es and uhs. So if I'm gonna stick by that mantra, and I'm not gonna just alternate sticking, I'm gonna use my right hand on the downbeats and the left hands on the e's and uhs, then the first bar, one e, a two, and a, is right, left, left, right, right, left. Again, right, left, left, right, right, left. And instead of right, left, right, left, right, left. I find that this gives me much more accurate rhythms. It also allows me to have much more even sounds when I'm thinking about keeping my right hand on those downbeats, my left hand's on there. Now, the danger, of course, with the right hand sticking, or dominant hand sticking, as it were, is it's real easy to come off doing something like this. Where I start accenting every note that's on the downbeat just because it's my dominant hand. So you have to be very careful to make sure that that weak hand stays the same dynamic. So for the first bar at a slow tempo, not, you're going to want to do if you're not very careful in thinking about it. Now, taking a look further down the piece, some other things to be aware of is that line number uh, two, we have an interesting little accent pattern. Now, in a classical piece, accents are spice. They are not the melody, but they are the thing that of, uh, they're a thing of interest. We want to be careful to pull out the accents, but not overdo them. So, for example, you what would be good to play the second the second line like this. <laughs> not 
that is way overkill. That is where we're getting into rudimental drumming cat, uh, style, which is what we're going to have on our second piece. So focus on keeping those accents just a level above our, our dynamic level. So from mezzo forte, bring the accents there at about a forte, forte plus sort of level. All right. Now, the other thing that's a little tricky in this piece is we have some challenging dynamics in the third and fourth lines. So be sure that you're keeping your sticks at a height that's going to really reflect good dynamic practice. For example, I tell my students for pianissimo, you want to be about one inch off the drum. For piano, about three inches. Mezzo forte, six. Forte, nine. Fortissimo, twelve. I call it the rule of threes. One inch for pianissimo and everything after that is in three inch increments. So if I'm at this third line, piano, I'm going to be about three inches off the drum. For mezzo piano, I'm going to move up to around about that five to six inch range. For forte, I'm at that nine inch range, and I'm going to come right back down at the end of the third line for that piano crescendo, back to about three inches, coming back up and back and forth. So let me demonstrate that for you a little bit. Let's start right there in, uh, at the beginning of the piece. I'm just going to go part by part and point out the dynamics, point out our sticking as you work through a little bit line by line. Now, if I practice this enough, I'll eventually be able to work it up to quarter equals 120, which is about this fast. Ba -ba -ba -bum. So one E, a two, and a one E, and two. So if I'm playing that now with some nuance and phrase, it'll sound like this for the first line. Notice that big jump from that, from that uh, nine inch height down to that three inch height. The judges are going to be listening closely for that. Now, then I'm going to be moving from that three inch height up to that mezzo forte, slightly bigger for the second line. Now, a big trick a lot of students are going to miss is that crescendo at the very end. We want to make sure we're getting both crescendos in the last two bars. A great way to practice that is simply to take it slowly, working on no buzzes but just the skeleton. So I'm part start with that pickup at the piano in the second to last the pickup to the second to last bar, and I'm going to start with thinking like this: and a one e and two e n one e and a two. I'm going to practice playing that. Then I'm going to put the buzz in slowly. Now notice that buzz sounds terrible at a slow speed. That's fine. I want to keep my skeleton sounding bad at a slow speed. So when it comes time to play it fast, I've memorized those hand motions. And when I'm ready to play it at chord equals 120, it's going to feel natural and feel good. I'm not having to rewrite my stickings or relearn my stickings. So now, even though it sounds terrible at a slow speed, that last bar, at a fast speed, they sound great. So I'm going to try again the last two bars. Here again, just the skeleton, one and two. Notice that da 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 dum. Now I'm going to play it at tempo, and notice I'm going to try to keep that same feeling of that up and immediate drop. All right. Now, one final thing. Uh, the very last note, there is what we call a housetop accent there. That's not a rim shot. Uh, we don't want to end. That doesn't belong in a classical style piece. In with just a good solid accent. Okay? Don't overdo it. Okay, for our second etude here, the rudimental snare drum etude, this one is simply a collection of rudiments that have all been kind of strung together, kind of like a string of pearls. So it's good for you to take time when you first learn this, rather than simply trying to ram the etude over and over and over, take time instead getting each measure's uh, rudiment slowly and carefully uh, learned. So for example, rather than simply playing the first line, if I'm, if I'm just a beginner trying to learn this, I'm doing it a very bad way. Rather than doing that, practice doing just the first bar with just good five stroke rolls. Do it again. Okay, so notice I'm working on getting a nice clean diddle. And I'm nice, a nice accent that definitely comes up above the main uh, sound of my rolls. Now, Another mantra I like to use whenever I'm teaching rudimental snare drumming, unlike classical, is that the accents are the melody. Now I'm going to say that again. The accents in a rudimental piece are the melody. In a classical snare drum composition, like the one we just played a moment ago, we have the contours of the rhythms themselves that are the melody. But in this piece, in the case of a rudimental piece, the accents are what matters. So for example, when I jump down to that second line, I don't want to play it like this. <laughs> But I want to hear those accents. 
they should definitely come up at least a level higher than what we would think of as a classical feel. All right? Now, the biggest problem that most high school students are going to have playing this rudimental snare drum up piece is simply the ability to play clean double stroke rolls, or also called rudimental rolls. Now, this sound <laughs> takes a lot of practice. To control that, I highly recommend a simple exercise that works like this. One E, a two, and a, E, and four, and. One E, a two, and a, E, and four, and. If you play from a drum line perspective, it's often called double beat, very famous warm up. So, try that with me if you could. Once you've got that, speed it up a little bit and then add another layer. So I did the double beat, then I just a little diddle with the right hand. The trick is not to change my grip or stroke. Keep the same feel with those back fingers as I do right there. And then when it comes time for the roll, it becomes and don't change the grip. A lot of students get a great double beat. And when it comes time for the roll, they suddenly play. Back fingers come off and it gets sloppy and we lose control. Always control the diddle on a double stroke roll. Now, that means when it comes time for you to do your actual audition, if you need to play this piece not at chord equals 120, but at chord equals 80 or chord equals 90, but at a slower tempo where you can have a clear diddle, that is so much better than hearing a, a 120 roll that sounds like that sounds sloppy and we can't hear the diddles at all. So ideally, you want to work your way up to that chord equals 120. That's the gold standard for rudimental percussion. That 120 beat, that that's the sound of a rudimental snare drum roll um, in any march by Sousa. So we want to make sure we can control those diddles, but it's much better for an audition to take it slow, keep it under control, and make sure we have a nice clean diddle. So. Um, the other thing that's going to be challenged after you can get a good control roll at 120, the next thing that's going to be the biggest challenge is that very last line. Those rhythm cues and even that very last measure is a nasty little trick. Making sure again that the melody is in the accents. That last little sixth tuplet is hard to get that flam to come around and not go and make a, a little flop there at the end. So that's going to take time. Again, slow and steady wins the race. Just loop it. One bar at a time. As I said before, you should go through this entire piece. Measure number five, the second line. Just looping those paradiddles. Gradually adding speed. The double pair are the less than 25s in, the, in measure number six. Just looping those slowly. Adding speed. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so let me play through the piece for you a little bit, and then you can hear how it sounds, and then I'll lead on with some other videos here over the marimba etude as well as the timpani etude. Here we go. So, it's great working with you, and I hope you check out the other videos as well to help you in your all-state auditions for 2022.